So I've got a little pre-prepared here for the benefit mainly of the people uh, watching the stream and listening to the recording. So as I say, if you just bear with me for a second. Um, swearing is not prohibited, but for the sake of bearing in mind the audience who may have to listen to this, I'm going to request you keep it to a minimum. And I'm now going to start recording. Okay. Wrong cat starts recording. There we go. Right, welcome to the first community balance discussion, and I'm hoping it's the first of maybe a couple more going forward. Thank you all for turning up, and I'm hoping for a fairly constructive discussion. Uh, hopefully we can all get to know each other a little better. Um, just to set expectations accordingly, I'm not expecting us to draw any specific conclusions from this because of the highly speculative nature of the discussion that we are going to be having this evening. Uh, it's more about gauging the breadth of opinion on a range of subjects as per the agenda items which hopefully you've got somewhere on your screen. Um, we're going from alpha into beta, we don't have many concrete details at the moment, balance hasn't really been the key focus thus far. So we're looking to go for some very broad brush strokes here, um, very high level sort of stuff, not going into too much detail and we need to find out what we do want in very vague terms and what potential pitfalls we want to avoid. So initially I'm going to try and get us starting in a fairly loose format. Um, if, if you're polite and allow people to finish we can sort of allow it to be reasonably open and not too structured but if it does get a bit too much then I can enable the speaker things to keep the balance flowing accordingly. So, without further ado, let's have a quick look at the first item, which is the basic and advanced tiers. Um, particularly, I think, with, with this, we need to establish what should be the defining differences between the two. And I think probably the best person to open this one up would have to be Nana Lathe. This is your particular pet peeve. Thank you very much for the floor. Hello, everybody. My name's Nana Lathe, and um, I... If anyone has ever been on the forums ever, I think you should be aware of my position between basic and advanced tiers. I'm firmly against the idea of an upgrade over um, uh, a, uh, the, the previous tiers. So we should not have something that is available to be built in the basic tier that is then available to be built in the advanced tier, but with all of its numbers just increased. I do not see the point of the advanced tier if all it is going to do is ape the basic tier but make the bit numbers bigger. Uh, that goes across everything, I feel. Um, I, I like the idea of it not being part of the economy either, so making the economy not something that needs to be upgraded. What do you suggest uh, an advanced metal fabric tool would work? How would it work? An advanced uh, metal extractor should have... Eh, it really depends on how you want to start defining basic and advanced, which is again something we should start defining here. So, basic. Um, a lot of people think that basic is sort of a, a cheap option, um, whereas I'm, I'm a little bit on the, uh, on the fence with that one. I kind of think that basic units should be sort of jack of all trades, quite um, quite utilitarian and having a lot of utility, whereas advanced uh, take a What's specialist on, route. Is there anyone in here that takes the opposite view that um, tech two or advanced units just be a power increase? I'd like to hear some arguments against. I wouldn't say uh, I think that they should just be a power increase, uh, but one point that was made there by Nano that I disagree with is the economy. Uh, I feel like the it's already restrictive enough, this game, in terms of being difficult to be a defensive turtle player. Um, one of the things that you can do to try and help your position is by tacking up quickly so that you can get advanced economy and have a bigger economy for the same for the, a smaller space. Uh, I don't see any way of doing it other than by having a, just a simple structure that is just better in its basic stats. Uh, uh, other than that, I, I think it's true that pretty much the majority of the successful strategy games that are around don't have units that are simply better than the basic units. I'm thinking of StarCraft and things like that. When you have Marines for Terran in StarCraft, they're a, a jack-of-all-trade unit and you don't have a 
the, an advanced marine in the late game, you know, just get more specialized, more powerful. Uh, and I think that works pretty well because then you you find yourself making the basic units for the entire game rather than having a point where you have to make everything in the advanced tier or you're wasting your money. Uh, so I agree with that part, but I don't agree that the economy should not be upgradable. I think that has to be the case for this game. The other thing about things like StarCraft and things like that is um, I find their units particularly more specialised depending because it becomes more of countering your opponent and out microing. I mean, with Nanolay's point about uh, the advanced being specialised, I agree they need to have some specialisation, but we don't want to go overboard because then we'll end up with some things being, you know, used in small groups for certain things, whereas as we've established, this is a sort of big armies versus big armies game, and with too much specialization, you run the risk of it becoming, you know, small groups and heavy micro. But uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm frankly, but uh, I don't know uh, English very well. Um, but the micro is uh, really important in the starting of the game. Uh, when when you see uh, replay. From Zephodix, uh, uh, the last replays are all about the macros. So every team is taking uh, one, two, three bombers and taking out the uh, the, the fabricators. Well, I mean, obviously, at the beginning of the game, you've got more things to focus on because it's you know smaller scale and all of that while everyone's still building up but i mean sort of later mid to late game when you're all advanced units and things you've got say big armies of ants big armies of levelers etc and then you have you know you before you want to move them in you have like these really specialized units which in effect almost border on being caster units because things like starcraft you only use the caster unit because of their cast ability, rather than um, just general attacking, if you get my point. I, I well, sort of... Sorry, Cyb Cybernet Pony, carry on. Alright, I sort of disagree with, uh, you know, that Uber of just trying to make the advanced units completely uh, overpower the basic units in general. And the reason I say that is obviously what we've seen so far, the artillery unit is only available in the second tier, and the anti-air is not available in the second tier. So there's always a reason to sort of keep your basic buildings, but if we're going to try and take a look at the main unit which is being used, which is like the ants and levelers, and how, you know, the leveler is just completely superior to the ant. The one thing about that that uh, I sort of see a big difference in is chunkiness. So, the ants uh, obviously die to levelers very much, and obviously levelers are more cost effective. But to produce the amount of levelers in ants, uh, you know, to make them equal, uh, levelers cover a much smaller area. And for a game where you have these mass destruction units, such as nukes, and, you know, we're going to have things like asteroids, um, it's much less of a problem for me to see a second tier in the game where the first tier can lose some of its power um so i i do i do agree that there should be some units which in the basic factories uh still carry on to the later game uh to prevent um the basic factories once built from being completely obsolete late game but at the same time, I do see a point channel. in having a scouting or early combat sort of phase where, like, I'll give you an example because I've played a lot of RTS. StarCraft doesn't have this so much, although there are some units which sometimes from balance only happen to be used at certain timings. But I'm just thinking of, like, uh, another strategy game I play called Akron, where at the beginning of the game, infantry is particularly useful, but later in the game sort of comes out. It doesn't really uh, change uh, how good the game is played, it, it, especially we're going to see a lot more units. Um, some units do phase out 
in games and Subcom as well, you have the labs, which obviously very good for harassment at the beginning of the game, and then stop being used in favor of T1, T2, T3. It, it, I do think that it's not as much of a problem as it could be. If I may, if I may uh, oh, oh, scientist, right. carry on. Uh, I can't hear you, scientist. Yeah, you're a local mad sci scientist, you need to, uh, ah, you've got, got um, your microphone activated. But we can't hear I can hear myself. Echo. Is this better? Hello? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's better. 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 Okay, yeah, okay, sorry, extra switch. Okay, so, um, I concur that the main progression between the tiers probably works better as a specialization thing. But there's actually an interesting question underlying here, which um, 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 I, I don't have an answer to, which is fundamentally... The whole point of a specialized unit is that it is good in one place and not good in other place. That, that's what it means to be specialized. So what are people's views on the concept of the late game, the mid game, and the early games being a special place, if you will? I don't necessarily have a problem with small amounts of units being obsoleted as long as you know, it doesn't override the large, you know, lots of units becoming over obsoleted. If I mean, I speak. Speak. Sorry, go ahead. Um, my name is Ghostflux, and I personally think that um, every unit should be able to be used from the early game on to the end game, simply because the more units you keep into the usable unit pool, the larger the amount of uh, viable strategies is. And, and that's what's a good RTS, in my opinion. Don't you feel that there should be a risk-reward sort of uh, dynamic for early game units? Um, not really. I think that the, the whole uh, risk-reward thing should be coming from making the choices as to how many of them you build. Like if you like focus if you... on uh, tier, uh, like basic units early on, and you build a lot of them, you're already committing too much to uh, basic stuff, and levelers will just wipe, pretty much wipe away the ants without any effort. And I think there should be a specialized unit, not a leveler, but a specialized unit that can take care of those ants in a good way. Well, that's the whole idea behind specialization. Uh, in other games is that you have a, a basic tier and then a second tier to counter the basic tier and then an extremely expensive higher tier to counter that middle tier. Uh, whether or not the game gets to that point, that tends to be how they specialise the units. It's not so much basic units and then units that only do one task well. It's it's more of a stepped increase. The trouble is that the one, the one criticism I have heard of the whole specialised role um, concept is that people seem to think that it might turn into a rock paper scissors type affair. Source disconnected from your channel. I don't think you can make that uh, that argument when scouting is so easy in the game. Well, the, the argument is made that I've heard made is that if you see rock, you are forced to build paper to counter the rock. So if you see someone that's built rock, you have to build paper. I think I think I phrased that right. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't right. see that as a problem in a strategy game. I don't know. Um, it's not actually a criticism from from me. It's just one that I've I've heard made. If it's the case that you only have one and only one effective counter, yeah, I I I personally don't find that that compelling. But if it's well made, then you can have multiple counters, and you you get choices in the in how dynamic is in which cho what choice you decide to pick. It can also be like a hard counter unit versus a soft counter unit. So you, one unit can be soft countered by one other unit, and then one unit can be hard countered by another unit. In the case of maybe even Co Company of Heroes 2, where an anti-tank gun can one hit another tank, but an infantry grenade can at least two hit it. Right, just so, um, we get... um, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I um, wanted to move on with a few more points, because as Frankie has just said in the chat, uh, we are spending a rather long time on just the first point, and we have got quite a few to plough through. I think we've had a fairly good little chat around the, the two tiers, and one thing that I wanted to quickly discuss uh, very, very quickly is the intermediate tier, 
which is units which can be built by Tech One fabricators, or sorry, by basic fabricators, I should say, um, but cannot be built by the commander. Um, I'm interested to know what people think should fall in that bracket and why. Um, well, first what of all, sort of, um, what, what, currently, what is build? in that? Um, what is currently in that bracket, anyway? Radar, radar, walls, advanced factories, counters, radar, yeah. walls, and the first tier of artillery is pretty much it. And wall and pelters. That's what I said. Oh, sorry. No. I, I think that's alright, to be honest with you. I think that's fine. But no I units uh, in that in that list of things. I, I think this is more coming down to units that can be built from the factory rather than units that can be built by engineers. The, the tiers for buildings, they shouldn't be structured in a way that it's basic, intermediate, advanced. They should just gradually increase in price and I don't think you need a, an intermediate factory or something that builds slightly better units than the basic factory, but not as good units as the advanced factory. I don't think you need that. I think you need units that come out of the basic factory that are more expensive or that need an upgrade to build them. Like, you need to have so-and-so to build it. That would mean you present too many choices towards the, the newbie players. I wasn't suggesting for a second that we introduce a, a middle tier for units. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. I was, just, I was talking specifically about those, as I say, those buildings, as you said. Oh, yeah, well, there's a small number of buildings that fabricators can build that commanders can't. And personally, I think it's good the way it is because if commanders could build walls, radar, and pelter, then pretty much, you know, you'd have the constant threat of a commander just coming at you with a wall creep, turret creep, pelter, and then radar, and then. He's got the commander there to sort it out, whereas he wouldn't actually need any fabricators per se, because the commander can then rapidly get up a factory because of the increased build speed and things. So I think it's better Very... that fabricators can do that. Very quick question. Is there actually any real reason why radar should be denied the commander? Yeah, Do... uh, because basically you can plop one down at the start of the game, and if you're sporting in close positions, the other person hasn't got his factory, hasn't started his scouting yet, but you have the advantage, you come in and it just turns into a comm duel, but you've got the advantage. Can't he basically do the same then? He can do well, the same, he, you know, first yeah, engineer but... builds a radar turret, it's not actually that much of a delay. Is there a real reason for radar to not I be think, given to the commander? I think Marshall's it point is, a... is the reason, is that they don't want them to be able to build things, like the, the laser defense turret. Uh, for example, uh, can shoot further than it can see. So you get more power of it by building a radar as well. I think it. I think they're trying to make it so that you can't push solely with the commander. Because if you try and PD creep somebody and they've got a radar because they've built engineers and you haven't, then it's not going to work because they just build one PD and you can never take it off. I, mean, I, I think, think it was a, a conscious decision to remove the radar and the other structures from the the build power of the commander. I think and it was it was a correct one as well. I think the best example of what happens if you give like the commander artillery and radar early game is yeah subcom 2's upgrade system and especially considering the map sizes were so small then you know I remember playing it when it came out and there were so many times when the commander the enemy commander would be in your base shooting at stuff getting research points getting his artillery on his back or whatever plus his built-in shield and radar and stuff, and then you're just sitting there defending back foot and just losing ground constantly until your commander's gone. So I think um, it's a good sort of choice to leave it out of the commander. One, one note here, uh, uh, Frank again. Uh, at uh, size one planet, uh, commander can build a basic radar and then you can see uh, the uh, one half on the on the planet, so I think it's it's okay if you choose it. You, you yeah. can see it. Isn't isn't a lot of this a differentiation of a very small, tight knit game versus a big, drawn out game over an entire solar system? You know, once we've got that in. Yeah, but you know, we have to allow for a lot of different kinds of games that are possible, and. To be honest, I think it's a good decision not to have radar. It, it doesn't actually make that much of a difference timing-wise, but the very start of the game, where things are very, very mathematical and could actually probably be worked out on paper, it's just safer not to include radar. I do hope that that is changed by the uh, egg, by the way. 
Seconded. Very, very much seconded. Seconded. Egg, please explain. Um, can we, can we do that after the meeting? Is a, yes. That's yeah. I, I'm, I'm yeah, conscious okay. of the time. Um, We've actually already addressed the third point in our previous uh, discussion on the sort of prog and actually that was covered by the intermediate tier as to the speed of progression through the tiers. And I wanted to get some opinions on the concept of a very basic orbital tier, as in buildable by the uh, that would probably fall into the in intermediate buildings category, as in not buildable by the commander, but buildable by a uh, Tech One fabricator or basic fabricator. Very much in favour. Yeah, I al I always assume that orbital. It's kind of a I don't know a Tech One point five and a Tech Two point five. If you know, I mean, I, I hate saying it that way, but the idea is that the basic one is buildable by the basic fabricators, and the advanced one is buildable by the advanced fabricators. So it's kind of offset, but one up the tech tree. But would an orbital basic unit also be able to build an uh, an advanced orbital factory? We I would hope so. We oh. Does right anyone now... have? Sorry, does anyone have any actual objection to orbital being a relatively cheap and easy thing to obtain? I do. Thank you. I do. I do. Depends on what it would do. I think. I, I... Yeah. It really matters. So what do people want Whittle to be? What? Well, I, th I always assumed to Orville to be the X3, essentially. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, Orbital should be sort of the support unit, but their support can change the balance of the game. For example, maybe a laser Orbital that could annihilate an entire base, whereas a nuke can only annihilate a certain portion. I was... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I saw Orbital uh, as just another axis, like air, is sort of, you know, closer to the atmosphere, Orbital being a completely new one. So, so far we've only seen two Orbital units, which I think is the Orbital Fight and the Orbital Radar. And I think the decision to put the Orbital where it is now is based solely on the fact they've only implemented two units, which you can get superiority instantly, and a radar which is super strong. So... But now, does that radar need to be that strong? It it doesn't really, but I feel that if they rejig it, then the position could definitely change. Personally, the way I think of orbital, I don't Actually, think Mars of like battles ranging in a higher tier of you know orbit. Obviously, I think of it as sort of your defense grids and your means of transportation between planet to moon and stuff like that. I don't think of it as another battle layer. I think of it as defense, support, and transport. I was toying with an idea today where um, you would not initially see resources on other planets unless you probe the planet for its resources. Basically send a scanner unit uh, to a planet to see what kind of resources it has. And that unit can also be used to just scout. That's what I would like to see for uh, tier one uh, or basic yeah. units. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a that's good idea. Small goes valuable. If there is scouting to be had in the orbital layer, which I, I, I do think is a good idea, then it, it makes sense to have it early. Now, I, I could be mistaken here, but from the discussion we've had from the, deve the developers, on the forums, it, I'm getting the impression that the actual moving to other planets from an orbital perspective is, is done by a transport of some description. You know, you saw the lander in the Kickstarter. So if you wanted to move an orbital unit to another planet, you would have to build some kind of lander thing around your planet. You'd load orbital units into it and then take it to another planet that way. That That's my reading from the various discussions with Neutrino about this. The other thing to add to that is that he sees, well, not he, but Uber sees that as a late game thing, or a, a mid-game thing at earliest, not something that you can do pretty much immediately. Right. I think, I, was, I don't want to harp on too much about Orbital, because there was a, that huge forum thread on there, and I'm sure Uber is sick to death of hearing us talking about Orbital, so I'm going to now move on to the next set of points, which is to do with the game pacing. Um, fairly open discussion. Damage to hit point ratio. How long units last in battle? What do we think? 
Yeah. Way yeah. too short. Yeah. Short, sure, definitely. I actually find Very it short. extremely appropriate for just the scale of the battles. I think if you made it too much smaller, you'd end up with traffic jams of units on the front line. It depends ultimately on the units you're using in that battle at hand. If you're using some hulking beasts, then obviously they will take a lot of punishment. But if you're using something like ants or scrampers, then maybe that type of battle will be relatively short and it should be appropriate that way. Well, just to bring up the heritage here, this is a game that was based on Total Annihilation. A game that's famed for its very long battles. Battles that do not immediately have something dying as the first shot it takes. It does seem a bit of a weird disconnect to come from playing TA to coming into playing PA where everything basically dies in one or two hits. Well, uh, one oh. thing, I've been playing uh, Supreme Commander 2 recently and everything takes forever to die. You can have 10 tanks shooting at one other tank and it'll take all of those 10 tanks to destroy just that one tank. So there's got to be a balance because... Um, at some point, we'll either have tons of hit points and tons of damage, or very few hit points and very few small damage, or we'll have a large disconnect of one or the other where, you know, you've got an aircraft that you've got like 30 or 40 anti-air guns shooting it, and it finally goes down after two minutes. I think with damage to hit point ratio, I think you don't want it too much, um, especially with the sort of main battle stuff, because obviously we're, they're going to be mass produced and things. So, like ants and scampers, they don't want to have high hit points um, because, as we said, they're going to traffic jam and they're going to just block up everything. I think with those sort of units, you want maybe, in effect, chances or lives to, to put it in a sort of layman's terms to the point that you can take maybe two or three hits and that gives the controller a chance to move them out of the way to micro rather than just a bang you're you're gone sort of thing but if we if going back to the specialization thingies then you know you're going to want if, if those you know we are going specialization then those are going to want more hit points obviously because they are more specialized i would actually say the opposite i just wanted to quickly read out um, for the benefit of the recording what marshall miles has just said in the ch chat um, he's mentioned he's just played a game of TA with Nano, Liquidus, and Cryo, a uh, Cyro rather. Cryo, sorry, Cryo. Yeah, it's Cryonic. Um, yeah, Cryonic. And um, he's, he reckons it should be around about 10 shots to kill a single tank. Just 20. 10 or 20. I mean, 20 uh, is maybe a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah, 20 is an exaggeration. I think the, what the... unit is firing at the tank per se? I think, it's, I think uh. he's talking about tank on tank. Okay, like the same ranking? Yeah, the like same for like. Mm. So Ant versus Ant. I think with this, the scale so big, you need to be able to steamroll through the planet, though. Otherwise, it'll, it'll take so long to make progress. The I think sweet it comes... spot here is between TA and PA. Yeah. I think the current uh, speed is a bit too fast, and TA is a bit too slow for PA, so... Anywhere between five and seven shots would, in my opinion, be the sweet spot. Can we talk about seconds? Because shots are very relative in the way to fire. Yes. How many I agree, seconds should you... a tank that's being fired on by its equivalent other tank survive? Seven shots. That's fine. Seven seconds at the moment. But ultimately, it comes down to whether you want the sort of World War One style rigid front lines, slowly moving front lines where you sort of advance fairly slowly in a dead zone in the middle, or whether you like the sort of fluid gameplay whereby you may think your front line is secure, but then all of a sudden someone accidentally goes around the side and wipes out everything from the back. It's, it's depending on what sort of gameplay you're trying to nurture, I think. The... Also, I would like... Oh, sorry, Master. No, 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 you go on, you go on. I would like to bring up the point of how this also works uh, with buildings. At the moment, I do feel like the economy buildings feel flimsy as all hell. Join your channel. I disagree, because if you have... This is Burncaster, by the way. If, if you have a few docks attacking metal, they take ages to get rid of it. May I just say that because of the scale of the game and the multiple planets involved in a single multiplayer match, as well as maybe even a single player match, 
that we should really have a more fluid gameplay as a slow gameplay on multiple planets could bog down the game to the point of everlasting 40 hour games yeah i think okay. that's the main point is that it's it the, the, the scale of the game is going to dictate how long it should take to kill a unit and if you can have 400 units at one time easily on a front line then it shouldn't take each one it shouldn't take 20 is if you have 20 tanks shooting one once a second and it takes 20 seconds to kill another tank you're only going to kill 20 tanks a second it's out of 400 it's just going to take so long to do that it's the same with yeah. total war room 2 to be honest because in total war room 2 they don't have individual units you can micro you can only micro giant groups of units to make things a lot more easier because of the scale of the game is so large and the multiple battles you'll be facing off against will overwhelm the average player that's a point that Grep's bringing up there. Hey, Grep, do you want to read out for us now? Um, uh, Greppy is bringing up the point that with the with it being how it roughly is at the moment, the the power level means that once you have a lot of units in one place, you can just steamroll things. Nothing can stop them, apart from actually a literal wall, because walls are currently ridiculously powerful. But once you once you balled up a unit in you know just one type of unit even you can just steamroll your way across the whole map and nothing will ever stop you especially when it comes to levelers wouldn't the answer to this be uh, more accurate artillery or something like air or something so maybe more not natural but the accuracy of artillery is already pinpoint and it doesn't stop it yeah but uh, again the air at the moment is just you know too sh shots and a bomber oh, dies. Yeah. And there's currently no reason to build bombers because air superiority is just so easy to take over your ground that, you know, just bombers are completely... the health is just completely wrong at the moment. And although I agree sort of that tanks are very, like, short-lived, I, I agree that there should be some room for micro, but it shouldn't be, like, 20 shots. It shouldn't be slow. It should be to the point where Twitch comes into play, but doesn't detract from strategy. That's, well, a, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty fine line to tread. Um, also, I, th I think it's quite easy at this point to get bogged down by saying, well, yeah, the, 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 yeah. Air, the units feel like they're made of paper, when we, we've, we've still got a lot of balance stuff left to go. Now, in terms of asking what we want, well, you know, look at the economy. The economy at the moment, there's so much metal out there that you're going to be, you know, throwing mountains of units around pretty quickly. And I think that that's probably a bigger part of things feeling like they're on speed at the moment than anything else. Good point. Again, I don't feel like the games would take too long or too short at the moment. I, I feel like the game lengths are okay for single planet battles. Okay, no. Right. With that, I'm going to take advantage of the pause and quickly bring us around. We're still on game pacing, but it's a slightly, slightly different tangent here. And that is how... You're talking about the length of games, of course, already. How quickly can planet-killing technology be fielded in a game? How easy is it for you to get to that point? 45 minutes. Very That's specific. Precise. I can disagree so, with on that. So, Ghost Flux, elaborate. When you say 45 minutes, is that a rush towards that technology, or is that in the usual course of a average game, you should get there at 45 minutes? I would say the, the average course of getting towards a point where you actually have an asteroid at your disposal to launch at a player. Um, just getting units onto the, the the asteroid itself should of course be faster but the, i wouldn't want to be uh, killed by an asteroid before the 45 minute mark because that's right around the the time that that smaller games uh, just start to become a bit exhausting I have a question in terms of planet killers. Now, when you're on a single planet with no moons and there's suddenly an asteroid and only one asteroid to control and then a player uses that asteroid to destroy the planet, does the game become a draw or does it go to the winning side that uses the asteroid? It depends, First, it depends, on, it depends on the asteroid, yeah. If, the, if there's both commanders <laughs> yeah. on that planet, then it'll probably be, it'll be a case of whichever, whichever commander gets killed 
by the collateral first. It's well, I think the, chance. the asteroid mechanic, I remember them, uh, Uber, talking about this and they said they weren't sure how they were going to make it happen, but they said... Uh, Master! Marshal! That's rough on this. That's um, rough but, on this. Uh, I think oh. they said that there was going to be, uh, with asteroids, an area of effect which would make sort of a no-build zone, but obviously there's going to be damage done in that. But I don't think, you know, it's going to be planet-killing. It would just be area-damaging and therefore not producible honourable, if you get my meaning. <laughs> so I've... So, I've, sorry. Um, so I've recalled talks from the forum whereby the, the idea is that depending on how fast the asteroid is going when it hits and how big the asteroid is, you know, you're talking about from something that can maybe level a continent to take out a planet. It very much depends on the specifics. How fast can you get to the point where it is a, a basically a guaranteed knockout a planet? A whole planet? I how fast do you want to get to that point? I think it should be stupidly long because I personally don't like the idea of being able to completely destroy planets, especially in galactic uh, galactic war, because if uh, if I draw a tangent to um, Star Wars Empire at war, when you're the Empire and you get the Death Star, you can just go around and it becomes a case of win in your space battle, and then you detonate the planet and you don't need to worry about land battles or anything like that, and it just becomes a case of how many planets can you kill before you win. You can't... You can't. Uh, galactic war will be like a risk map and every battle will be an instance. Doesn't it is not like you can take your army from one plant to the other. At least that's not how I feel it. But this is like very speculative, isn't it now? Isn't it now? No, but I mean my point is as soon as one player gains that advantage, it will be very very difficult for the others to get up to that and knock the other player off their high horse as it were. But in a galactic war context, which is the context you've brought up, it would only be on that one battle. You know, they've won a battle, the rest of the war is still there to fight. It doesn't snowball from battle to battle, if we're talking about galactic war. Isn't this sort of like an experimental unit in Subcom which acts like a game ender? It's supposed to win you the game once you get it? Well, not yeah, necessarily. Maybe. It depends if if the enemy's got five planets under their control and you smash one, it's not going to end the game. But it will hopefully, if you destroy the planet which has got most of their economy on, then it'll give you certainly a bit of a, an upper hand. Also, we also, should put uh, we should talk about how like anti missiles like against a huge asteroid should like it should destroy half of the asteroid, but it will still damage your base. Cryonic, that's later. That's that's in the uh, thing, but it's later. Ah, uh, it's later. Oh, that's sad. I think moving on then. Yes, let's move yeah, on. Yeah, moving on, please. Right, now, I was asked by Sir Vladimir, who is the balance chappy who started at Uber about a month ago and recently emerged on the forums, to bring this up with you. And he wants to have people's opinions on the application of Micro as a balancing tool. And the example he gave me at the moment was that currently some well Micro doxes can take out their equivalent number in ants. However, if they're not being Micro, the ants will win hands down. So, um, so, case so, of, yeah. so sorry, sorry, guys. I think yeah. we had uh, again uh, about timing uh, for game facing again. Uh, the first five minutes, uh, I'm a little bit late, but uh, for first five minutes, it's about uh, expanding and um, then uh, the building tier one, then uh, from five to ten minutes, it's about uh, upgrading to tier two. And in 17 minutes, you can get a uh, nuke. So just think about it. Um, not, okay. That is only the, when the, you're the, brushing the, it and you have no pressure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 17 minutes, it's uh, against AI. Uh, when you, you, you just uh, play. <laughs> Uh, no, no, top, top 10 players. Okay, uh, back to the micro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frankie. 
So, okay. Knight here, I just want to say that in terms of micro, I don't feel micro should ever determine a unit's performance. I think it should, within certain degrees, augment it, but never be the deciding factor in whether or not that unit is useful in combat. Exactly. Mm, I agree with that. Agreed. One. Agreed. I concur. I disagree with that. <laughs> on a basic level, there are so many units in every strategy game that require micro to get any use out of them. And it's exactly the kind of thing that separates good players from bad players. And I think it's exactly what you need to have a good a good strategy game. But that that, that is, the, is the case I, in I, I certain games. Disagree. I yeah, think that's, certain that's, units... Guys, can we let Knight Guys, one person spoke. at a time. Go on, Knight. So that is the case where the units are designed and the game is designed around that principle. The whole point of TA, subcom, and PA is that it subverts that to certain degrees. The point that I would raise about the micro is if, and this is a counter to yours, Neptune, about good players and bad players, if we're fighting this game on multiple planets, any one player can only focus their attention on one planet and indeed one half of one planet at a time. If one player happens to be looking at a battlefield, the other player is not looking at that battlefield, they're busy doing something somewhere else. Why, is, why should the player that has a view of that battlefield, um, why should they have the advantage over the player who's viewing elsewhere? Well, because they're looking at it at that moment. If you, uh, Does that there's not nothing wrong with it? surprise strategies or anything like that. I think the I mean, I just don't like the idea of units that have no have no distinction between just a moving a unit and being able to control it in a way that you get an extra hundred percent efficiency out of the unit. Because you're asking players then to choose between either controlling their units or expanding their economy, and I think that's always a good choice to be forcing on players rather than just if you build better, you win the game. I just want to point out that I didn't say that micro shouldn't have an effect. I just don't think it should be that 100% efficiency increase. If I had to pick a number off the top of my head, I'd say somewhere around 15 to 20%. Something that can help turn the tide of battle if it's an evenly matched battle, but not something where you can take five units and kill 50. I'm currently it's 100% uh, if, you, if you look, uh, sorry, if you look, uh, uh, they predict, uh, uh, Replay. I don't know. It's six uh, seventy or seventy. Um, you 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 can see when the bomber is taking one shot uh, directly one uh, AA um, uh, the building uh, out out of the game. So it's uh, currently un widely uh, unbalanced. Well, that was uh, that was a game yeah. that I was in. That was me and Klops in that game, and I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that's a fair example of what's happening in every single game at the moment. That was an extreme situation where the team we were playing against didn't build enough anti-air defense to deal with the bomber. But I do agree that the way that it was used in that game shows that the skill of a player, like if you just had a unit like a bomber that you you just A moves or whatever and to get efficiency out of it, why would you ever make bombers? They're designed to be a hit and run unit. And you're meant to be controlling them when you're using them. It's exactly the kind of unit that I like Super having in the game that you have to have skill out. to use it. But you're sacrificing your attention elsewhere in order to do that. If I may interject, that should be the that should be an exception to the rule rather than the norm. Yeah, so the, the question I'm asking here is why why is this a execution based game here what what is the reason why being able to click in the right place very fast and with precision the the thing that the game should be testing for as the definition of good players I'd rather see the the game's definition of good players to be you know who can come up with the craziest and most interesting strategy not you know purely APM and stuff like that we've got other games well, for that. I think it should be both um, a mixture of like it's seeing really who can click yeah, in the right place at the right time most appropriately and also building in macro. Well, what yeah. about, for example, uh, let's take doxes and let's say when you attack them, instead of just clicking into a base, assuming you've got the appropriate intel, you'll know where their defences are, where their strong points are. You'll then use shift and shift and click and you'll have them sort of patrol or move around in a fairly complicated way. But 
they'll all be automated, of course, with the shift click commands. And then you can take full advantage of their mobility in combat while at the same time not um, not requiring you to micro them as heavily. And I think the question that he was really, um, Vladimir was trying to ask, is exactly what um, your local mad scientist just said there, which was about um, should players be rewarded for being able to click faster? And yes. I, I think actually I, I, I agree with Knight's sort of. Um, 15-20% figure is about right, is about on the money. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, that's, that's not bad. I don't mind as long as it's not excessive. Uh, like. I think currently it's a butterfly effect. When, when, you, when you can see the, the Zephyrix uh, replays, a um, uh, few, few bombers in... Um, Okay, I, I can say the the Neptunio and, and Klops and ATC, the, the guys are the, the best players currently. Uh, but uh, when when you can um, micro uh, uh, so much, and uh, I, I I see uh, in, uh, in in two three minutes how the how the game ends. It's, I think, uh, not not very good. Um, when you get uh, two two bombers and you can see you you win the game, it's about micro. Uh, and, so you're, uh, you're trying to say that early game micro is too decisive for the the, the overall ending and uh, development of the match. Uh, almost yes. But again, it's 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 one game that's being referenced to. I've, it's the only time okay. I've ever seen it happen where the game's finished within the first three minutes because somebody controlled a bomber well. I don't think it's a problem in the game. The problem is that was me. So go on, Master Ruffleness. Oh, okay. Um, currently, we need a lot more games, a lot more testing to see how this really affects the overall playability of the game. Like, if we're only referencing one game, then that's not really a good statistic to go based on. And we need a lot more games to play out. And currently, I see that if we have better spawns, and if we have people who can generally micro to an average degree, then games aren't going to kind of get to a ludicrous level where all of a sudden one specific micro will win the entirety of the game. One thing that I want to say about micro, which is very important, is that too little micro creates a stagnation in games where it becomes computable and where it becomes very easy to just print off a build order, do it, and win the game. It, the good thing I, that... I disagree with that sentiment entirely, I'm afraid. I think there's so much more complexity. Is that I've, I've already spoken a lot about this on the forums, but there's different kinds of challenges which games present to players. Micro is a very specific kind of challenge. It's a challenge of execution. There's also challenges of calculation, which you've talked of, and there's the final most interesting, which is a challenge of choice, when you get a lot of things and you've got to pick one, and you might get the you might you know there's multiple right answers there. Personally, the only I mean, so far I think micro should only really come into an advantage if, say, you have doxes or scampers versus ants, and currently. I've seen, as you said, you know, doxes take out equal number in ants only because the person has kept their eye on them and has kept them sort of moving around the tanks while presumably the person who controls the tanks hasn't got their eye on the tanks and is countering that micro. So it only really becomes effective if, you know, you don't have two people focusing on the same battle at the same time. So it then becomes a case of flanking and strategy and then it adds sort of into that sort of arena. <laughs> Doxys are better, currently are better uh, against ants, but uh, perfect against enders. I, I think uh, Dox are okay, currently. Um, if I may, uh, Nanolays again, I'd like to shift it to a point where you have units, some specific units that quite probably are in the um, advanced tier or the specialized tier that perform very, very well when you micro them and perform very, very badly when you don't. I like the idea of some units being inherently micro-focused, like, for example, the commander already is. I don't like the idea of an entire 
uh, section of units, say bots, being you must micro these or they fail. That seems very shallow to me. Well, that actually then helps to address the issue of attention spans. Because if you see that your enemy is building these micro-intensive units, you know that he's intending to spend a lot of his attention on that particular um, battlefield. So you'll perhaps spend your own attention there to counter them. But that might not be the case. I just worry that it's too much of a slippery slope, that as soon as you can control... Because the thing is, assuming equal player skill on average, you won't be able to build enough to counter that 100% increase in efficiency. You might be able to counter like a 30 or 40 or 50% increase, but not 100%. I, I would say that's not exactly true. I'm going to use Company of Heroes as the basis of that decision. Uh, Company of Heroes has a unit called the Sniper, which is almost able to, you know, tenfold its efficiency with Micro, but it is itself takes such an investment and is so difficult that you know most players, even pro players sometimes, opt out from using it and they do not actually lose anything in terms of how well they compete. There should be some units which are adapt to certain flavors of gamers. So while I agree that micro, you know, should be something that's optional, I don't think the game should be completely without micro. Because without micro, a lot of players will be turned off. They'll just find it boring. And, you know, I like being able to dunk my opponents with, like, free well micro units. Okay, but at, at least uh, the anti-air, what, what, I, what I saw in the, in the game uh, when the bomber takes the AA down, it, it shouldn't happen. Well, that's, that's an outlier, isn't it? It rarely happens. I mean, we've played hundreds of games, and that's only happened in one. And that's... You know, that was just lack of expectation, really. Also, just we need to keep in mind that, I mean, the example for Company Heroes might work in that context, but we're working in something that is almost the polar opposite, where we've got not one unit that we can increase ten times, we've got a hundred units we can increase one or two times. So it's, it's a bit different. But I, I would say that it's still possible to include such units without making micro be the deciding factor in a game. It, it is perfectly possible. Uh, Agreed. Agreed. There should be so, there should be some units that you can use to micro, but it should not be the norm. It should not be every unit is better when you micro it. Maybe I think cast... if you if you had a game that was that there was very very little micro in it as well, I don't think that would be a game that would be very interesting to watch. I think it would kind of look like people are just kind of choosing their strategies, building their factories, building their units, and changing their rally points, and then you're just kind of watching units slam into one another. And that doesn't seem in my head to be a game that's going to have a lasting a lasting lifespan. If, if we want eSports, Micro that. is the way to go. Well, not even for eSports, just for... Like, not everybody enjoys playing a game. A community is, is based around people that enjoy watching games as well. And if you just have a game that's like, I, I see it as being like chess, almost, if you just remove all micro from the game. I think and, what will be and different yet. about... Sorry, Sorry um, on, go on, Knight. I think what will be different about PA is that, I mean, especially once you get into different planets, having multiple planets, you'll need to do different strategies on those different planets. You won't be able to just use one strategy continuously. You'll be adapting to what your opponent is doing, whereas I see when you're very micro-focused, you are using the same thing continuously because you can get that improvement out of them. Right. I'm going to, again, take advantage of the silence here. Um, what I'm going to do, because we are approaching the one-hour mark already and we're not that far through the agenda, um, I'm going to move on to the next topic, and I'm going to basically ask you to discuss all three of the points under the next topic uh, at once, and that is basically, and I'll read this out for the benefit of the recording, naval, air, ground, orbital, and their interplay. How interlinked should the separate layers be? Should each layer be specialised towards a particular theatre of war, or be a fully contained, or sorry, a self-contained, fully-fledged collection of units and or structures? And how many other layers interact with the orbital layer, and how do they do so? There's a lot of points to take on at once, but if anyone wants to have a go, start off. 
Um, for me, like in particular for Orbital, I've always seen it as very much a supportive layer that rather than doing things within the Orbital layer, they affect things on the surface combat, which is the rest of the layers. When you get into things like Naval, we will have water planets, so they need to be more self-contained or, yeah, self-contained. But for things like land and air, where they generally are always going to be sharing the same space, they don't need to be quite as self-contained. I think in particular, what we're looking to reference here is um, that the naval bases obviously are an example where um, you have a completely separate theatre of war now, but you can now build every building you can build on land, more or less. You can now also build on water. Uh, I think this is actually, I think Natalie brought this point up, and perhaps you want to go on a bit more with what you meant by self contained or fully fledged Annalise. Um, Not really. <laughs> It was kind of me um, just asking questions about the orbital layer and uh, the naval layer. Sort of, so to take on what Knight was saying about the orbital layer, it, it kind of comes down to the point where you, you look at the orbital layer and you say, do you want orbital space fighters? That's kind of what I mean when I say, do you want it self-contained uh, self uh, and fully fledged? If you want the ability for the orbital layer to be able to police itself, so orbital satellites which specialize in taking down other satellites, or whether the, the idea of getting rid of orbital units is something that you push over towards you know, naval units which have uh, cruise miss, uh, which have um, anti-satellite cruise missiles, or ground units, so um, anti-sat missile launchers, or units that even uh, take on that role rather than just structures. I think it's necessary in games where, let's say, we had the very few planets set up, but both players that are against each other in a one v one set up on the same planet. Uh, I do think that there needs to be some sort of ground to orbital sort of combat because otherwise what happens is the first player who gets to orbital maintains the superiority and wins the game as a result because the other player cannot push out his satellites because they get taken down. That would also depend on exactly what satellites can do. If we go with the support method where they're only enhancing the ground, they will have an effect, but they won't. It's kind of goes back to the micro point where it's not going to be a triple fold effect to land units. I want to see it going a bit in both directions. I want the, the different layers to interact, but I also want uh, to say the same layer uh, to have combat that is meaningful. I agree with that one. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm a bit on the, f on the fence about orbital combat because I don't want it to turn into an air 2.0. Because yeah. why would you have that? Yeah, have I, I think like we're all agreed that air 2.0 is a, a bad idea. I don't think anybody wants that. So but it's orbital not just... space fighters, GTFO. I'm, I don't want to bring up, again, <laughs> more, more stuff about the orbital discussions. I think we've, in terms of how orbital performs and how it operates, I think we've fairly well sort of decided to let Uber take their own um, direction with this and see how it goes. If if it turns out that it doesn't play very well, then I'm sure we'll be the first to let them know, but I don't want to go into orbital mechanics if we can avoid that, if possible. Alright, there, so we have to skip the next point and move on to movement between bodies then. I think that's the best. Okay, okay um, that's a good idea actually. I didn't want to linger too much on orbital because that has been heavily discussed. So, we'll go on to movement between bodies, invasion and defence. Now, interplanetary has not yet been implemented, so this is us throwing around ideas only. We've got nothing in-game to discuss at the moment. So the, the questions I want to ask and seek your opinions on are how expensive or time-consuming will it be to transport large armies between bodies, and how would you suggest that we pr pragmatically and effectively defend against invasion without causing stalemates, i.e. if the defence is too good and impenetrable, then all you're going to get is two players holed up on different planets and not able to attack each other. From what I've heard from what Uber has planned for how to invade other planets, they plan on using a teleporter as well as a unit cannon. So I think in order to defend against a teleporter invasion or maybe even a unit cannon invasion, what we can have is a little indicator on screen on the UI as well as on top of the map 
where it shows where the unit cannon will fire and where the units will land. So you can rush your army to the landing zone and shoot off any units that come their way. Same with the teleporter. However, that could also be unfair for the player who's on the offensive. But I guess that's the risk that the offensive player is taking. I... With... Sorry, with regards to the teleporter, um, Neutrino has actually spoken a little bit about it. And the, and the impression I'm getting is that you you will need a structure where you're sending your units from and you will also need a structure where you're sending them to. So if you want to use them to invade a planet, which sounds reasonable, you'd need to make a beachhead via other means and then build your teleporter there and then you can start pouring units through it constantly. Yeah, Correct. to me it always seemed that their idea behind the teleporter was not so much for mass transporting of armies as much as removing the time factor at at a higher cost. For me, and, and the whole idea behind invasions is all about beachheads. For instance, um, the defensive player has the entire planet, right? You clear us up a space with a nuke, then you send in um, a uh, and a defense force. The defense force uh, defends your core group of engineers. Like we all know that a group of engineers can, a lot of engineers can build a lot of stuff really fast. So it becomes like a, a sort of holdout game in which you have to defend your position for long enough to be able to build up production to actually start taking over the planet. So you clear out the space, send in your, your strike force that will obviously have less units than the, the defending player has, and just try to hold out against his waves to set up your position. From that position, take over the planet. You could do this on multiple spots at the same time, for instance, on a larger planet, to so like have a multiple spot invasion and then try to tire out your def the defender. We also have to keep in mind that with PA is that if they do have an quote unquote impenetrable defense, we always have the option of using an asteroid. We don't have to worry about making it so that you pretty much, if they get to the point where they can make it incredibly hard to make that beachhead, chances are you've got uh, the resources to pursue other means to deal with it. The thing is, this is my point about earlier when I talked about Star Wars Empire at War. And I know that was very much sort of moving armies between planets at times and things, but it became a point, as I say, where I no longer needed to worry about ground battles because I could just blast the planet and, you know, the enemy stuff was gone. I think asteroids should only do a small area and things like that and be obviously very expensive. But in terms of getting to a planet and things, I think you should have an alert definitely that tells you when someone is approaching sort of you know once they've given the move order or something it gives you a certain window at a certain time obviously maybe say a 45 second window or something in order to bring your attention back not giving you enough time to sort of get everything ready but bringing your attention to it I think though that the asteroids won't it, compared to Empire War the asteroids aren't always the answer they're only the answer if They've, the enemy has invested so much that you can't land on their planet. It's not the catch-all response. So we might have to keep in mind that there might be multiple ways to deal with an in incoming asteroid. Maybe a laser, another rocket that could shoot it off course. So there are defensive measures that the opponent that you're trying to invade can employ that could stop your asteroid advance. Well, to me... Um... Because I know at one point Neutrino did mention that specifically showing that even though they shot nukes at the asteroid, it still hit the planet. To me that says what you can do is, rather than preventing an uh, asteroid hit, is you're preventing greater damage. You're pretty much scarring the surface rather than creating a huge crater or destroying the planet. That seems about right. Um, instead of a one-hit wonder, you have a meteor shower. That exactly. makes sense to me. And there, there's also been lots of talk about, I'm not sure how much has been from Uber's end, but of actually command, commandeering the asteroid as well. I have a quick question. How many confirmed modes of transportation are there between the different planets? Are there just teleport and unit cannon? Can you instead commandeer an asteroid and put some units inside and have a surprise attack? So instead, if an opponent is thinking about... Um, kind of destroying the asteroid, then what could happen is units plop out and attack him on land and surprise him instead of the usual old meteor shower? 
That sounds like a question for Knight. Yeah, Neutrino has specifically mentioned teleporters, unit cannons, the lander, and that's it. The thing is, though, some of those are multifaceted. Like, the unit cannon works from a moon, but you can also build a bunch of factories and unit cannons on an asteroid and just put it into orbit so you have an, essentially a giant orbiting factory so there's definitely three specific options at the moment but the, some of them are multifaceted so there's no um, confirmed notice of an asteroid moving units well, well yes it does but it, you can't smack the asteroid into a planet and have units pop out of the wreckage because it's wreckage yeah, to me, it's that would be just going too far. Like having a drop pod land on a planet that's built to, you know, get from orbit to planet is one thing, but just crashing an asteroid into a planet orc style is a bit too far. Okay, I see what you mean. Basically, you just instead of crashing the asteroid, you just put it in orbit, and then you just have unit cannons continuously spewing out units. That makes a lot more sense, as the units inside the asteroid can very well just and be annihilated. Exactly, yeah. Right, I think actually we've actually managed to cover the movement between bodies, and we've covered the large-scale destruction points as well. Um, I think, if, unless anyone can think of any other points to raise in those two bullets, I think we've um, covered I that. I do want to, in terms of nukes... Because I know initially, earlier on, there was hopes that nukes would be less so, kind of more scaled down rather than this like high cost because we do have the asteroids instead for the big kind of finale type weapons. So they'd be more varied and less binary, but so far that doesn't seem to be the case based on what's in the alpha. I would very much... Sorry, go ahead. I would very much like the nukes to be scaled down to V2 rocket levels of destruction rather than, you know, being able to cover a whole continent in destruction as they currently kind of do. Well, the maps are going to be bigger in the future, I believe, and the games in general are going to be bigger, so the nukes won't play such a big role, they wouldn't make such an impact. That's not the impression I had. I know earlier on in the alpha people were complaining about the planet size and new, uh, Uber commented that the planet size earlier, before we could make our own planets, was indicative of a one, like a one v one planet, for like a smaller game. But at the same point, the thing is, nukes are priced and powered to such an extent that you probably wouldn't see them in the smaller game, anyways. Yeah, I think when talking about this, you need to take into account a few things. Is it more than a one versus one, and to Not what extent are people going to fight over things? I mean, if it's a, a greater than a one versus one map, then of course asteroids are going to be there because one person can focus on the ground and one person can therefore rush for the asteroid or whatever. But if it's a Not one versus one, one then one I think, channel. you know, people aren't going to be worried too much about the asteroids because you've got to focus on so much and everything and I think just going for those asteroids would be disadvantageous to you when you can possibly finish it off quicker so I think nukes only need to be scaled down in as far as the defense needs to be scaled up yeah I kind of yeah. agree with that and I'd, I'd also like to see a little bit more variety in terms of defense I mean you know in in nukes in or ballistic missiles in real life go pretty damn high above the Earth's atmosphere. There's no reason why we couldn't also have some kind of orbital mechanism in the orbital layer to um, fight against nukes as well. And if you also have mobile units, or I'd, I'd rather see nukes have more viable counters than see them get scaled down. At which point, if they have more counters, you need to make them more readily available, so they should be cheaper. Uh, I, th I think the uh, I'll be okay with that. anti nuke bit of building is okay, but the missiles are too expensive. They take too long to build. Well, I think the problem with the whole nuke system at the moment is that it's incredibly binary. I mean, yeah. it worked for Supreme Commander because they were very powerful to the Small point of being one hit wonders, as able to essentially wipe out a base. But if we powered them down, we don't need that binary aspect. It's okay to you know lose the core of your army. If they're, you know, if you have options yourself to, like a mobile 
defense unit or just the fact that it's only one army that you lost the core of, but you've got three more just kind of on the way. Yeah, I think um, it would also help if nukes were a little bit... Small foes join I think it would help channel. if nukes were a little bit faster, because that way you could use them more effectively against armies rather than having to blow up part of someone's base, uh, having to go for static structures. So that perhaps they um, could be scaled down to do a bit less damage, but then they would definitely take out armies and... The Metal, Metal Gear Rex tactical out. nuke launching. I, 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 I must disagree because uh, the nukes are currently the most the effective killer joined your uh, channel. weapon in the game. Because uh, you currently. can use, yeah, uh, maybe in the beta it will be changed. But currently, uh, when you build T2 uh, factory and fabricators and switch oh, with the maybe two, three. Um, energy power plants uh, to, uh, and then uh, start to, um, producing the nuke. You, uh, every every one metal spent to, to nuke is uh, most effective uh, spent uh, metal unit, uh, I, I think, because you, you, you don't have to um, to deal with the defenses or, uh, and everything else, you just uh, want to take two, three um, planes, scout, and if the the, the opponent don't have uh, or doesn't have the uh, anti nuke, you can just take uh, one half of the uh, enemy base out. It's, uh, I, 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 sorry to interrupt. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I didn't I get think, that from your I argument. Think, I think I think currently, if if it's good thing, I, I I don't know. Maybe it's good thing, but then the anti nuke is uh, very very bad because nuke can be used because nuke can uh, can be used against the infantry, against the base uh, for attack or defense or anything. But anti nukes can be used uh, with the with this, uh, approximately same cost uh, against uh, only uh, nukes. Uh, oh, oh, only nukes. Yeah, it's well. Uh, I, I, and also the, the the radius of the anti nuke is low. ATC. I, I, yeah, it's it's bad. I, I think uh, the anti nukes uh, must be uh, powered up or nukes nerfed. I I don't. But currently, in 17 minutes, that's my measurement. Uh, it's uh, normal. You, you can uh, just uh, blow. If if the enemy don't have uh, anti nuke, you can in 17 minutes. Uh, when you have the first uh, nuke, you can uh, uh, just win the game. Small foes like. I think, I think it's symptomatic of the binary nature is. You need the anti nuke to defeat the nuke. There's no way you can. There's no no other option. So you have to deal with it that way. But if we scale it down and provide more of the variety and just in general power it down to the point where you don't need that one big thing. There's also the issue that you can use nukes against any specific location, but the anti nukes only work in the specific area they're built. So to counter one nuke, yeah. if you need like... if you need three anti nukes in your base to protect it, you're already at a loss. I, I, I think there's issues that can be balanced in terms of cost here. For example, I kind of personally, uh, this is just my opinion, view that the, the nuke launcher should be cheap, but the nukes should be expensive, so that you can rush them because that, that launcher is, is buildable, but it's actually um, not necessarily efficient to constantly rely on them for everything. Whereas the anti-nuke, it should be the other way around. You've got to prepare, you've got to scout and know that your opponent is so that you've got time to build the expensive anti-nuke. But the actual missiles are really cheap, so once you've got it up, you know, that, that area is, is probably fairly safe. That also think, leads to issues. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I think, sorry, I'll just take advantage there, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think the thing with the sort of nuke scaling up and all of this stuff is we go back into the realm of 
a sort of 100% win guarantee sort of weapon. At the moment, when I've seen nukes in play, it's never been a game of one person builds nukes, the other person builds nukes, and it's sort of nuke volley to see who can blat each other fastest. It's never a case of mutually assured destruction. It's always a case of the moment one person gets the nuke, it's a case of the other person seeing how far they can run before they're caught up by infantry or whatever. And it, I think that cat and mouse game at the moment needs to be sorted out. But then again, you also have, because it's, a, if, if we're, it, it depends on sort of game sizes as well. If, as I say, one versus one, I think nukes should be expensive. I don't think people should rush for them in a one versus one. Um, but in a two versus two, you have that ability to take the hit on one base and then still have potentially another one to rely on. So I think, you know, with that uh, enhanced economy that the two versus two and the larger games create, I think it would make nukes more viable in those situations than in a one versus one situation. But currently, I definitely think the defense for them needs to be amplified massively. They just need to increase the range, that's all. No, they need to do a lot more than that. That, that wouldn't solve the binary nature of nukes as a whole. There needs to be more going on. All it would do is balance the current situation. It wouldn't fix the underlying problem. Okay, and with that, and with that, boys channel. and girls, I think I'd like to draw an end to the discussion of the formal agenda. And I would like to invite anyone who has a particular issue related to balance that they might have brought with them to the meeting to speak now or forever hold your peace, at least until the next meeting. Uh, I do at the moment, and it's regarding the advanced bot factory in terms of balance right now. I want to know what kind of roles people think that should have, because right now it's just useless. Um, since uh, if you try to go for it, um, the tank units that are tier 2 are superior, and um, in terms of, you just don't see them used because the tier 1 tanks do well enough against tier 2 bots, but tier 2 tanks don't have that sort of counter. And one thing that did surprise me as well is statistic-wise, um, that the artillery seem to be the only reason you'd want to get tier 2 bots right now because the artillery has this maneuverability but the tank artillery is still stronger so that's more what I want to sort of ask about I think when the game progresses throughout the beta we'll be able to have more and more bot units available to be purchased and built so I think that later on, maybe the advanced bot factory will have more usage as more newer and newer bot upgrades as well as bot units can be introduced to the players. I think that I think that appeals to a wider question at that point is what are bots for? What is their role? I believe bots are for raiding and like just running by a building and shoot at it. Not like tanks where you have to just bring them in and they just steamroll everything. And this comes back to micro and specialization. Or yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. We can look at Command & Conquer as a good example. Command & Conquer has vehicles, a vehicle factory, and has a separate infantry factory. But both um, kind of utilize units in a different fashion. And both have very, very different units apart from one another. One has a acid spewing tank. The other may have even a flying bot unit per se. Well, for the um, Command and Conquer guys. So maybe for PA, we can have sort of this dynamic where one vehicle factory can have acid spewing tanks, while another can have a flying mobile a bot. So at which point you say the difference between tanks and and infantry basically is what we're saying is maneuverability one has it the other lacks it yes and, more, and unique and unique units we also just have to keep in mind that command and conquer is pretty well known for its ridiculous um armor yeah, types yeah. and stuff like that so you can have an infantry sure a tank can do nothing but same thing for the tank yeah but, I mean, yeah. but the problem but, with command and... oh wait go marshall on i was just gonna have a quick point of um the sort of control of the game, whether you want it sort of big battles and all of this stuff, or whether you want it to be X unit does bonus damage to Y type. No, 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 no,
<laughs> 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 guys, 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 let Marshall finish. But we want to steer away from the doing less damage to certain types. I think damage should be pretty equal across the board in this style of RTS. But again, the movement and the micro plays the part that would bring up the um, sort of, you know, bonus damage, etc, etc. It's yeah. fine for some cost to be associated to the strength of the unit, but only if the the unit doesn't become overpowered like lever does. It still needs to be like a unit that is only viable in a specific situation so it doesn't become spam them out. Okay. I think we'll move on. Has anyone else got uh, any other... Sorry? I, I, I have a point, actually, still, with that. I think that bots, oh. as well as being more maneuverable, could be, in general, slightly cheaper than tanks or faster to produce, or both. Um, and I think that's one of the problems that they have now. They, they're much smaller, but they st they're still quite expensive compared to the tanks. The, the, would the you take tanks. that to the production... Sorry, um, would you take that to the production once the factory is built, or would you make bot factories faster as well? Um, I think the production of the bots once the factory is built. I, be I, I think that, what was it, that bots, or I've heard from one of the developers, I'm not sure if this is a clarified or confirmed, but I've heard that bots or some type of bots or bots in general will be able to traverse some areas or some planets, whereas tanks will not be able to. That, I'm just trying to think back. I don't think that's been specifically confirmed in any regard. I think the problem is partially just that they really need to explore the different planet options and stuff like that. There is certainly room for something like that to happen, though. Cryonic fire disconnected oh, from your channel. That's a uh, cryonic fire has disappeared and that uh, has brought to my attention. We are approaching, um, so I think it's an hour and 20 so far. Um, oh dear. <laughs> right, um, yeah, do we have any other points? That we'd I've like got to be brought one to point. Go on then, Debbie. Um, engineers repairing commanders needs to be capped to a certain point. You can't, you can't have it say you've got 20 engineers behind the comm and it's just instantly repaired. I don't right. How would you suggest uh, removing that mechanic? Increase but, the um, cost. The, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Or you could possibly just have a hard cap on you're only allowed said amount of healing through so much time, so, um, so. 20 health a Ooh. second or whatever Is this a problem be. with sniper pod? Uh, I mean, don't... Does it fall yeah. on the cost? Does it fall on the other player seeing that there's a sea of engineers repairing a commander and therefore prioritizing the engineers over the commander? Because presumably, by the time the commander is in your base, that's all there is. He hasn't got like the base literally behind him, unless, of course, he's defending, at which point it's fair play that he has all those fabricators. But once he's in your base, then the fabricators are as much at risk as the commander, and therefore you can prioritize them and no, presumably not. have enough to defend against the commander. I mean, I did it the other day in a game, and I run into someone's base with about 20 engineers with me, and went point defense, point defense, and carried on walking and kept doing that, and nothing could hit me. I think this is the type of problem where we just ignore like the effects and any workarounds and just cut it off at the base, just don't let the commander be repaired. It's already uh, an incredibly fun, advanced though. unit. No! I think there uh, the needs command... to be some sort of solution for it. That's I, just I my kind opinion. of agree with what Knight says there. The commander is such an advanced <laughs> unit, it is so unique, that why should the, uh, the, the bog standard infantry, or, you know, the robots that he's making, why should they have the schematics to know how to repair him? What, so you're Don't, suggesting what, an auto repair mechanic for the commander? Yes. The auto repair is a fixed Yes, weight. I can agree yeah. with some yeah. regeneration well, on the commander at that point. How about what, just how reducing about the amount of health the commander has? That makes him really, really squishy, and there's no reason to do that. No reason. <laughs> yeah, that has a lot of domino effect to that, and he, he's already only squishy partially enough. solves the initial issue. We've already seen the problem with squishy commanders with the events, um, bombers being able to six-shot them. Just make it cost a lot. Then you know you're gonna you're gonna stall if you're using twenty engineers. Then you've got no repair no, you're, left. Yeah. You're not. You're not. What you could implement is 
a different game mode for these different things. You could have an assassination game mode one where it's commander v commander, all things available, or you could have a sort of be careful with your commander assassination, <laughs> named TBC obviously, but where you have limited health, you can't repair and things. So it is a case of a chess game in effect with your commanders. Can the I question say then becomes of that is which one is the main mode because that's what you build the game around. Can I say that um, with this game, will it revolve around one commander and when you kill that one com commander you win the game across multiple planets or will you have multiple commanders for you to command? No. Single commander. No. Single no. commander, Sing assassination mission, the standard Th that always has been. Throughout the 15 planets that could yes. be in the game? Or the f yes. yes. There might be 15 planets but there's only ever one commander, you just need to find him. I, I completely disagree. I think the healing is, you know, quite easy to counter. You just bomb the fabbers and that, and, you know, yeah, that's, you was, know, that's just it. The point I'm making is you've got all that build power behind you. You can just build turrets and yeah, so quickly. It's so hard. Yeah, I've... but you're putting yourself at massive risk. But the thing is, there's so little time to react to that in a way. It's like, yeah, you can build bombers, but if you don't already have the air factory first, you've got to build that. Then you got to build the bombers, and by then he's already inside your base and seeing it and preparing for it. Well, then the counter would be to take your commander and just do the same thing if it comes to that. But generally, due to but then you the still time have the same takes, issue that you don't have the time to do that because the it's time already it too takes late. to get a commander to their base is quite long, unless they're in close positions where this generally comes down to conjules anyway. It could be a matter of fixing spawning rather than having this repair mechanic, because the repair mechanic isn't that bad, except in the early game. It right. also, we need to keep in mind that there is the, well, Neutrino has definitely said that he still wants to do the abilities. This is quite a while ago now, so we don't know what his update is on that, and also there might be changes to the way the Uber cannon works as well. Let us have, let us hope so. Oh, well, I really I, want the Uber Cannon to have a toggleable feature because at the moment it's a sort of right-click spam and does it work or does it not sort of thing. Marshall, play Total Annihilation Marshall. and it learn the glory of the D-Gun! It should just work like <laughs> TA. Simple. I just want to nip that there. That's a, I'm glad you brought that up, Nebby, and that'll probably be discussed, hopefully, um, ex oh, externally from this meeting. But I'd like to nip your one there, if I may, for this meeting because I'm very, very conscious of time. But I would like to make sure that everyone's had a chance to air any other points they would like to raise. I kind of, wise. I kind of want to say something that doesn't have to do with balance. And... Don't you dare. Okay, no, 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 not with what you think. Not with what you think. Not with what you think. Okay. I like to say <laughs> that in terms of unit variety, I'd like to see units come in a fashion where it's kind of like I don't like to make a lot of references to Command and Conquer, but I think I will make one more reference to the amount of insanity or the craziness that the units can have. I like to see maybe giant mechs that can tower and cross over the different layers, air and orbital. And maybe even we can have the orbital units if there's the orbital fighter still enabled into the game to shoot down the mech. Or, you know, some units that can change from naval to land, air to land, stuff like that. I just want to point out that that is a veritable beehive of things. And mm. it's not yeah. something that is easily tackled. It's I, I been very. It's, not easy. Uh, it's come up very often in the forums, and Uber has even specifically garnered specific conversations on that. And yeah, there's a lot to it. But in a game where we're only playing with robots, I think the ins and we have like a huge heritage with Supreme Commander and stuff like that, having even crazy Scorpion tanks coming into the fray. I think that crazy units have a good place in this type of game. Instead of the boss ants or Disagreed. levelers or stuff like Disagreed. that that look really boring. And I think, I think really a lot boring. of this depends on your definition of crazy here because, you know, it's do you mean crazy just as in really, really big? Do you mean crazy as in extremely powerful but requiring a lot of resources to build them? You know, the, there's a million different forms of crazy here. I guess what I mean by crazy, I mean by the different ways that you can utilize the unit. Right, See, the that, thing tends is... to, that tends to suggest that you want 
lots of little units, and each unit does the, um, does its own little little thing, and then you can combine all of them together to. I'm not saying make a super unit, but your army itself is is kind of you know, uh, ostensibly the super unit. Yeah, that's that. I can agree with that because you come down to the point where you want that unit variety, so that if you pretty much, I think the way. A good way of putting it that I like to use is that in a 1v1 game, you can have two players doing two different strategies, but none of them use, neither one uses the same units as the other one. They're using completely different subsets of units. Okay. And then it just comes down to the actual unit design and having, you know, memorable weapons and features to them. I'm going to... Ask that we leave that one there for now, Rufflenus. As I um, as is with no, that, no, that, that sort of thing has been satisfied. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Sexually. I have a subject <laughs> I want to bring up. Go on, guys, Fox. Um, I was. A, I don't think I've heard this before today, but we were discussing an idea the other day about the transition from basic to advanced units. And currently, yeah. it seems that in order to make some kind of barrier, they make the uh, the factory very expensive. And what happens as a result of that is that the, it becomes a very slow gain of tier two units, which really is needed if uh, advanced units are just side grades. So. What is your opinion on the making, instead of the factory expensive, the engineer expensive and using uh, tier one engineers to support uh, a single tier, tier two engineer instead of like uh, just spamming out advanced engineers? Well, that happens already. A lot of people just use one T2 engineer and have a lot of basic ones assisting it. And it's in a way it's not really fixing the issue, it's just moving it from the factories to the engineers. It's just that the engineers have the advantage of assisting whereas the factory doesn't. It's so kind of just shifting it over. You I can uh, start producing levelers sooner. Yeah, yeah the, the point of this is to uh, to simply be able to choose to go for tier advanced units straight away. But if you were uh, to make the engineer expensive, then you would end up with the advanced buildings being uh, behind the barrier instead of Greg left the units channel. itself. True, but we also have to consider that that's based on the way the units are currently balanced, which we, I think we generally agree on is not quite right at the least. Understatement of the year tonight. <laughs> that that was, I think, brought up earlier on in the meeting. So, uh, so, so we, we did discuss the transition between the two tiers previously. So I would like, and sorry, sorry to cut it shorter than what it otherwise would be, but again, with time, and I want to make sure that everyone who has not yet spoken would like can do so. Anyone else? Um, a single final point to wrap up the whole thing, Mr. Roncat. Do you see this as being a regular thing, and how often would you recommend this sort of meeting occur? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. It very much depends on the reaction to this meeting. I personally think, and I'd like to thank all of you for this, that this has been a really productive, very positive meeting, and I think this has gone exceptionally well, time overlap issues notwithstanding. But I think a lot of useful stuff has been discussed here and very, very valid points raised. And I'm hoping that this will then give Uber a chance to sort of have a bit of food for thought on what the community thinks after they've released beta, because I very much doubt they'll have the time to sit and listen to all of this while they're busy coding for the beta. As you're probably aware, they're all in coding today on a Saturday. Well, at least Garrett is. So, as I say, I think this, is, this has been very positive. As to whether this sort of thing will happen in the future, it very much depends on their reaction to this, what, what will be the recording which they'll be listening to. If it turns out that they find what we've had to say here very, is very useful, then they may well request us to have further discussions as we get further into beta. They may say that we are talking absolute twaddle, why waste your time? And in which case we probably won't have certainly 
um, as well, a publicised meeting. We'll probably have internal ones in the realm, as we always do anyway, when we're sat in the Asteroid Lounge complaining about levelers. But um, I'm so, hoping we can have a few more in the future. I think maybe what we could do for the future is instead of trying to make it this, you know, overall balance thing, is we if we try to do something like say weekly and then focus on certain points that have come up, like in the past week or from the last patch, then we can do shorter and more often and going to be more to the point and more focused. Absolutely agree. I'd, I'd like to add to that that a lot of the time with these things because you're limited to time, I I I, I personally feel it's better to pick one little subject and really hammer and discuss that rather than having a broad swathe and just getting to only touch on lots of little things. Agreed. I agree with I say, that. We, we weren't able to do that in this instance because basically balance has been very lightly adjusted in alpha but it's not been a focus. Now that we are on the verge of being feature complete um, in inverted commas then this was sort of a preliminary meeting to discuss what we want, and this is big picture stuff, but as systems start to get implemented, we'll be able to actually experiment with numbers, and that will mean we'll be able to discuss things in much greater detail than we have here. Also, I think if we should maybe think of it less so in terms of for Uber and more so in terms of for the community, because we have to realize that we're probably going to be getting, like, what, 20,000 new players potentially in the beta? Yes. And just keeping yeah. it so that they're kind of in the know so that people who aren't maybe as up to date with numbers or just as good with numbers can get like a quick like you know half hour recording of just like what's going on. Agreed. And with that, I think I'm going to bring this to a close now, boys and girls. Thank you very much for your time this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you for your company.